Howdy. Here we'll be going over the various forces that act on an airfoil of an airplane, and the phenomena of flight in general. The forces will include lift, drag, thrust, and weight, with lift and drag being forefront since they are determined by the airfoil and its configuration, while the other two are determined by the aircraft itself and its powerhouse. We can start with the most obvious, the wing. Then we can take a slice and form the airfoil. The airfoil has a few important properties, such as the cord line, which is the line spanning from the leading edge to the trailing edge. Next is the camber line, or mean camber line. It is the midpoint between the top and bottom surfaces of the airfoil, and when this line is incidental to the cord, we have a symmetrical airfoil. Now the orientation known as the angle attack is how much the airfoil is pitched in comparison to the dashed line, the horizon. Now, with all that out of the way, we can examine the forces acting on the airfoil. Here, we have an upward force known as a lift, the force opposing forward motion, drag, the weight of the airplane pulling down, and the thrust of the engines pushing the airplane forward. The weight and thrust will not be covered in this video, seeing as the weight hardly needs a derivation, and the thrust is the result of the engines and not the wing itself. So we can start with lift. Now we need a little insight into the mechanics of what the flow is doing around the airfoil. One way to show this is to get the streamlines around the airfoil. We increase the angle of attack on this airfoil and place it in a wind tunnel with smoke to show the streamlines. Here we can see the stream tubes above the wing get smaller while the ones below get bigger or remain similar in height before reaching the airfoil. We can take two stream tubes, one above and one below. We can then make comparable systems to represent both. The top one will be a shape going large to small and the bottom opposite. Applying the conservation of mass, and for this whole video we will be assuming incompressible flow, thus density stays the same, we see the velocity must increase over the top due to the decrease in exit area, while the velocity decreases underneath due to the increase of exit area. We also don't have to worry about the flow exiting the top or bottom since we took it on a stream tube and we know that the flow does not pass through the stream tube boundaries. Now we know the flow is faster above the airfoil, but what can we do with this information? Well one thing we can do is use it in a modified Bernoulli's equation where we neglect body forces such as gravity and pay attention to the stream tube as before. To start, we take old reliable, F equals MA, and then we separate the terms. First, force can be stated as the pressure acting along the X direction multiplied by the differential volume. Second, mass can be represented as the density of the air multiplied by that same volume. And lastly, we can note how acceleration is just the differential change in velocity with respect to a differential change in time. Multiply this by dx by dx, and realizing dx by dt is just velocity, we get acceleration equals dv by dx times v. Put all this back together, and we get the Euler equation. We then integrate across the points far ahead of the wing, and then just above and below the wing along this a single stream line. And our result is the Bernoulli equation, neglecting body forces, that is. Now, armed with this equation, we can place our airfoil back in the wind tunnel and take some measurements and solve the pressure differences and also solve for lift and drag due to these pressure differences. We take measurements upstream and find the values to have a pressure of one bar with a velocity of 35 meters per second and a density of 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. We also take a measurement and find the velocity at this point above the wing to be 75 meters per second. We are also taking these measurements along the same streamline, which is necessary due to the limitations of the Bernoulli equation. Plugging all this in, we find the pressure at this point to be 0 0.9736 bar. Repeating this process with a velocity of 15 meters per second on the lower portion results in a pressure of 1.006 bar. Now, this is at this one spot only, and it's not as we traverse along the cord. Also, with pressure acting normal to the airfoil surface, 
It would take a large amount of calculations to get the real values and the resulting forces. But since we're only explaining the phenomena, we will overlook the hard calculations and later we'll see that we don't need them in the first place. So we can see that the top is slightly larger than the bottom in terms of area. So we'll say that the area on top is 1.01 meters squared and the bottom is 1 meter squared. Well, force equals pressure acting on an area, so PT times TA will be down perpendicular to the cord and opposite for the lower pressure area combination. We find the components, up being lift at 2115.8 newtons, and to the right is drag at 812.2 newtons. Lift is always perpendicular to the free stream flow, and drag is always parallel to it. Now, if we were to turn this airfoil parallel to the flow and make it symmetrical, we would know the pressures would cancel out and there would be no lift or drag. Only that's not the case. Because up till now, we've been ignoring viscosity and its frictional effects. But now we will include them. To do this, we will need to start with making the airfoil completely flat. Now that it is flat, we can see what happens to a control area of air as it passes along the flat plate. It starts out with no change, then drastically gets drug along the plate. This is due to the boundary layer. There is an idea in fluid flow referred to as the boundary layer theory. One of its main points is that a fluid directly in contact with a surface has zero velocity in reference to that surface. When dealing with a viscous fluid such as air, this means that the lowest layer stops and the layer above it is slowed down by shear stresses. This continues upward until it reaches the free stream flow velocity. But this slowdown causes drag, known as frictional drag or surface drag. Through empirical testing and dimensional analysis, it has been determined that the coefficient of friction would equal 1.328 divided by the square root of the Reynolds numbers taken across the cord length. Well, now we have this random variable called the drag friction coefficient. Now what? Well, it turns out this coefficient is defined by the equation CF equals drag the airfoil experiences divided by 2 times the density times surface area times velocity squared. And the surface area in concern here is the full surface area of the wing. Now we can rearrange this to find that the drag is equal to one half times the coefficient of friction times density times the surface area times velocity squared. Now a more important equation when determining drag is the one where we put both pressure and friction drag together. This would be this one. Here CD is the drag coefficient and we also have a very similar one for lift here also. Now, for these two equations, the surface area is just the top surface area as seen from above. So we now have an equation to find lift and drag of an airfoil. But the CL and CD coefficients, well, they're not easy to solve mathematically and sometimes require computational power to solve them. Thankfully, nature can tell us what they are for a given velocity. We can rearrange the equation and solve for CL and give the airfoil some information such as air density, top view surface area, and velocity. We then place this wing back into the wind tunnel again and just measure how much the airfoil is pushing in the upwards direction across a range of angles of attack. At zero, we have zero lift due to this being a symmetrical wing. Now at 22 degrees, we have 2,156 newtons in the upwards direction. But as we continue along, we hit a max, and then it tapers off drastically, and we get zero lift. This is because we have induced a stall. There's no air attached to the top surface of the wing. But we also have this graph for CL values for this particular airfoil, going at 35 meters per second. We can then repeat this process for other velocities if we wanted to. Here we do the same, but we measure the backwards force the airfoil experiences. Now, 
zero angle, we have some drag. And as the angle increases, the drag increases. And we again now have a plot of CD values for this velocity. So if someone does enough tests and measurements to plot out across a variety of velocities, you could know how much lift and drag an airfoil is producing at various velocities. And in conclusion, there were a few simplifications and assumptions made in this video. But this places a foot in the door to begin analyzing airfoils. More topics to look into could include infinite wing versus finite wing, how the aspect ratio affects the wing, and also once the wing goes into the compressible region. If you enjoyed this video over airfoils, consider subscribing. I plan to make more videos about math, engineering, and fluid dynamics.